Oh, is that recording? Where is that recording? Why don't you take some time? I don't know. Well, um, this is show us how here at Upper Dublin we become innovative. We roll with the, uh, with just whatever the heck is going on. And uh, I would like to embrace this morning, but that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> a beautiful, beautiful experience and worship. And that's. Oh, we <laughs> so good. Here we are. Exactly. We're here. That's what matters. And we have <coughs> our own <laughs> Pastor George Denton. Woo Coming out on this morning where you had the ice and the time change. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, Pastor Keith. And so we're going to officially take a look at music. And we have an expert here, and he's going to, yeah, see that face, did you see that face he made? This is, this is what he does to me. If you're going to sing for us? Probably not. <laughs> but we're going to take a look at music for life, for lament, history, and the beauty of what we have before us and what if I'm a, an example of what we can take for granted. We sing beautiful hymns. We love them. Some people like me get teary-eyed at times that our heart just swells, but it is a gift from God. So we're going to take a look at how we can use that gift and learn from that gift. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I was doing some, uh, some reading, I guess, over the last year last few months and um one of the things that has struck me is that i i don't think that well i know <clears throat> i'm a person who's been interested in pandemics because um in my family i grew up with the story of a of um, five children being orphaned during the 1918 pandemic yeah. um, and uh, these children were the children of my grandfather's older brother. So when this pandemic hit, I was started to think about the things that I'd learned about the earlier ones. And I remember the historian Marty Mar Martin Marty saying in a talking case somewhere that the, the story of the 1918 pandemic was mostly just wiped out. More people died in that pandemic than in any war but you can hardly even find the history of the pandemic. It's like that kind of loss is just shunted aside, even though it affects millions of people. And, and this time, you know, so many people, it isn't just that people have died, it's the things we couldn't do. Uh, you know, it's only last Sunday that we could start to not wear masks, and some of us are kind of confused about, you know, maybe we'll wear them when we sing, or, you know, what are we going to, you know, it's just sort of like, and I'm going to Mexico tomorrow, and I don't want to test positive in Mexico and not be able to come back, and I'm not worried about picking it up there, I'm more worried about it here, um, and it's just, this sense of, of loss and that we really have and of things being out of control because it's not something that we've had any control over. And how do we deal with that? And um, so I'm a member of the Association of Lutheran Church Musicians and they have a, a journal that comes out four times a year. And the Advent issue had articles about well, there was one article about lament and using this as a time of lament um, because of the pandemic and our sense of being out of control. And in there, the author referenced um, both the Great Litany, which we used at, um, on Ash Wednesday, and also the African-American spirituals. So I hit on the idea that, you know, we should sing a spiritual every Sunday. And I thought we were going to be singing them at 8.30, but clearly I was wrong. <laughs> Since we didn't last Sunday or this Sunday. Um, but we, we are singing them at 10.30. 
Um, and so today I want to talk about the background and I I've printed an outline for you. Thank you. Uh, Stanley Auerwas is a, um, a philosopher and theologian who taught first at Augustana College in Rock Island, Illinois, briefly, and then he taught at Notre Dame, and then he taught for, I don't know, maybe 30 years at Duke uh, University Divinity School. And he's retired. I'm guessing he's in his upper 80s at this point. But I dragged out yesterday, once, last Sunday, I was sitting, it was before the sermon, and a quote from him just sort of hit me, and I went back to it. And it's this quote that's num point number one here. Only a people trained in remembering and remembering as a communal act, their sins and pains can offer a paradigm for sustaining across time a painful memory so that it acts to heal rather than to divide. Hmm. <clears throat> now, this is a statement about Jesus' cross, death on the cross, but it's also a statement about um, sharing, sharing grief and loss. Um, reading not that book, but another book of his, I became aware that I grew up kind of in a pre-enlightenment community. You know, with the Enlightenment, we have the sense that we're really separate from God and we're kind of on our own. And Enlightenment people ask questions like, why does God let these things happen that I never encountered until I was in my early 20s? I mean, we just didn't think that way. I mean, I grew up in a community that was, I mean, I was, I grew up Lutheran, but our community was really influenced by the Mennonites, and three of my four grandparents were Mennonites. So I was around the Mennonites a lot and had kind of grew up with that sense of community. My wife pointed out to me this week one of the things that makes me very unusual is she said, What is your strongest memory of your sister's funeral? Uh, when my, I, my sis, older sister died when I was nine, I said, It's at the end of the funeral, walking up to the casket with my parents and my brother and turning around and seeing all my relatives and our friends and family against the wall watching us. We, we were surrounded by that community that helped us to share our grief. And that's how Wasa's point is that the church is that community that helps us to, to bear the grief. We don't bear it by ourselves, we bear it together. And one of the things that's happening in our society is I have the impression that most people do not have that sense of community, of belonging to something that matters that deeply. <laughs> Those of us who are part of the church, like this one, are very unusual today. And it's it's part of the reason why people can't get along because they haven't learned how to get along and how to be part of a community. Um, you know, the church as a community is formed by the stories of the, of the people of Israel suffering in Egypt and their exodus from there, the stories of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And so, and then of Israel suffering. And we have a lot of that uh, in in the Psalms. So I'm going to ask you to take your hymnal and look at some Psalms. Psalms are uh, don't have page numbers in this hymnal because the hymn numbers start with the Psalms. So if you go to Psalm 13, start with that one. And we are on page. It doesn't have a page number. They're just before the hymn part. They're the first hymns. Psalm 13. It starts out, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I have perplexity in my mind and grief in my heart day after day? How long shall my enemy triumph over me? Look upon me and answer me, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes, lest I sleep in death. Uh, so that's one and now but you get to the end of it but i trust in your unfailing love my heart is joyful because of your saving help 
I will sing to the Lord who has dealt with me richly. What our wise says about the Psalms is that they're not on, they're an opportunity, these Psalms of lament are for an opportunity for us to name our suffering but they, and despair, but they also form our understanding of it and help us to share it as, as a community. And the spirituals do the same thing. Um, you know, they're, they, were, they developed among a people who were enslaved and, and could do nothing about it. Um, there was, there was no realistic prospect of their release from, from slavery and oppression. And they, their crying out to the Lord together was part of surviving it and, and dealing with it. And, and those, um, those uh, songs have, have stayed with, uh, with us and become a way for people who are not African American and didn't experience slavery to also uh, share their um, their sense of suffering and and crying out for God's help. Let's turn to Psalm one hundred and thirty, which is one of my favorites. So it begins, out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord, Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. If you were to keep watch over sins, O Lord, who could stand? Yet with you is forgiveness, in order that you may be feared. I wait for you, O Lord. My soul waits in your hope, in, my, in your word is my hope. And then turn to him 600. Because it's Martin Luther's setting of that song. This was written by Martin. Sorry. Yes, I both the words that. and the music. Did he do quite a bit of that? He did. Yeah. He did. Most of our congregations don't sing his hymns. If you grew up in Missouri Synod, you probably sang, <laughs> you yeah. sang more of his yeah. hymns. But those of us who had the affliction of growing up in the Lutheran Church in America, <laughs> we didn't. We didn't learn these. I didn't learn these till I went to college or learn about them. I didn't really get to sing them until later. Well, especially when I was a pastor and I got to pick. <laughs> um, but, you know, this is a, we have a number of hymns that are settings of, of, psalms of, of, of lament, but there are ways that singing the hymns even are a way that we share our grief with one another and carry it together. <clears throat> one of the tradition among the Mennonites, if you go to a Mennonite funeral, they're a little different than what we're used to. Um, because they don't read a lot of scripture and they don't have a lot of prayer. They probably maybe read one scripture lesson and the preacher will preach. And they're, they don't have the kind of prayers that we have, which always sort of shocks me. They talk a lot more than we do. At <laughs> but they do sing. I mean, at a typical family funeral, we would sing maybe six hymns, a cappella and four part harmony. Uh, and it's that that helps the community, I think, their, their grief. It's that act of singing. Like, I mean, my memory of it is sitting among my aunts and uncles, you know, and I'll sing tenor and my uncle next to me singing bass and my aunts behind me are singing soprano or alto. And it's like the whole congregation is a choir. Now, let me tell you, they're losing this, my younger cousins haven't learned to sing in the same way that the older generation did because my parents generation they had singing school and they taught them how to do this oh, wow. um, did they have organists or no 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 now they have pianists and it screws it up <laughs> <laughs> to the point where to the point where i've told my cousins that 
we need to sing hymns in four part harmony at the funerals. And if they can't find the song leader, I'll do it. And if they can find one, I'll pay for it because I don't want us to lose it. To lose it. Um, it's a problem though, if we have a funeral in a funeral home because uh, we don't have hymnals and stuff. But I have one of those coming up, so I've got to figure it out. Um, the other turn to uh, number 238. Again, it's a hymn number. Those of you who were here Ash Wednesday will recognize the words. We, we didn't attempt to sing it because if we had a choir, we would have divided it up and had different people take different parts of it. Because it's a lot to sing, like when you get to rule and govern your holy Catholic Church to guide all servants of your church. For one person, it's it's a lot to intone. Uh, so we read it at, at Ash Wednesday. But as Gail Ramshaw points out um, elsewhere, you every affliction we can imagine is included in the great litany. Um, war, bloodshed, violence, corrupt and unjust government, sedition and treason, epidemic, drought, famine, fire, flood, earthquake, lightning, storm, uh, all, all these, and our time of tribulation, in the hour of our death. I mean, it just, it goes through all of the things that we can imagine that could, could go wrong. Um, and ask for God's mercy and help. Well, in, in the process of just singing or speaking the liturgy, we're being formed as a community that's aware of these things, that acknowledges their reality and shares the pain of, of bearing them. So, um, yeah. The Gail Ramshaw, this is number four. During the centuries of legal slavery, the enslaved Christians sang their communal laments, using the biblical stories of suffering as metaphors for their current agonies. I just want to pay attention to the time. Sure. Um, I have a question, please. Yeah, sure. How do you, I mean, I love music. How do you believe singing these laments helps one walk through the, the grief? Well, I think there are several ways. One is that singing together is the only way that human beings can all occupy the same space at the same time. There's no other way for us to do that. Um, you can't speak something together in the same way that you can sing it, because when you sing, you're combining rhythm and pitch and words. And when you do that, you can actually get a group of people to, you know, to sing something together. Um, so how and have you ever gone to the Christmas festival at St. Olaf, Bill, or Carol? You know, did you go to St. Olaf? No, no. Aunt, my aunt did. Some, did someone else raise their hand? Okay, Cardio Mar had that. Well, Same yeah, thing. any of those Upper Midwest. Well, it right? isn't only the Minnesota Lutheran ones. It's <laughs> also the Iowa one. It's you know Lutheran College does it too. But they have these Christmas festivals, and it's a big musical production. But they always sing some Christmas carols or hymns during the festival. And so, at, at, I haven't ever been to one except at St. Olaf. So I have to use that as an illustration, and it's in the gym because that seats, I don't know, 2,500 people. There are 500 people in the choir. And, oh and, my gosh. Yeah, so it's about 2,500 people. You stand up and you sing these things together. Well, where else do you sing with that many people? Mormon <laughs> Tabernacle. Well, maybe, right. But it's a similar kind, similar of, thing. Yes, kind of experience exactly. that we're sharing our, our belief. Our, who we are, but we're also being formed in the process of 
of seeing and, and sharing it. And that's, that's also part of the effect of the spirituals, that they form the community as one that could bear this suffering together. Uh, before we get into the spirituals, well, yeah, okay. Um, I, and I, I think the spirituals are attractive to us because they're a way that we, that suffering can be, and triumphing over it even, can be universalized, that we attach our own. Like, Turn to lift every voice and sing, which is 841 in the end. So this was written by two brothers, James and Rosamond Johnson, and it's referred to as the Black National Anthem. I get emotional whenever I sing it because it really you can look upon it as the immigrant experience, an expression of the immigrant experience it, that has nothing to do, it arose, this is not from slavery, this is from, they wrote this in the 20s, I think, um, or early 30s. But, you know, stormy the stony the road we trod, bitter the chastening rod, felled in the days when hope unborn had died, yet with a steady beat. <clears throat> Have not our weary feet come to the place for which our parents sighed. We have come over a way that with tears has been watered. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughter, out of the gloomy past, till now we stand at last where the white gleam of our bright star is cast. You know, this is an expression of suffering and hope of anybody who's escaped from something terrible. Jim Crow was going on. Right, it was. And, and so, it, but, but what I'm saying is the way it's written and when we sing it, it's a, it becomes universalized that, you know, so I've been reading some of the history of Ireland because we're going to Ireland in June. And it really makes you hate the English, by the way. <laughs> um, yes, it does. And so, you know, you could, this could be from Irish immigrants, for example. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a, there's a universalizing about it when, when we sing it. And the, the other thing about the spirituals is the way they were sung. And Gail Ramchalk reminds us that it was the full participation of the whole assembly in either common moan or harmonious melody. And that it was a communal lament and the unlikelihood of any release from their enslavement made the laments lengthy and weighty, the singing gradually quieting with no triumphant resolution. So the way we sing them is not necessarily the way they were sung, at least in the time of slavery. And afterward, it really even changed more. Um, I want to say something about history. Um, it's funny how I learned about this history. Um, we went to, our youngest daughter went to Lutheran Summer Music, which is a, a, a music academy, a month-long music academy for high school students. Um, those of you who are grandparents, if you have a grandchild who's really musically gifted and is a good thing to pay for is for your grandchild to go to the Lutheran Summer Music Academy. So it was at Luther College in Decorah, Iowa. And uh, we stayed about 15 minutes away in this little village, Stillville, Iowa. And we stayed there, well, because it was cheaper than staying in Decorah. That was one reason. But the other reason is it's the little community that Antonin Dvorak, the composer, Bohemian composer spent the summers of 1891 and 1892. Um, it, it's a Bohemian community. So while we were there, I bought this book about Borg, titled Borgeat in America and started reading it. And what's, what was so amazing was part of it's about spirituals because 
Dvorak came to the United States to teach at the National um, Conservatory of Music in New York, which was started by Jeanette Myers Thurber, uh, a wealthy, wealthy woman. And she really wanted, well, at that point, you know, in the late 1900, 1800s, there was all this talk about what was the original American music. You know, they were only playing European music. The time <laughs> most of the major orchestras had started, you know, in the well, right after the Civil War and up to about 1900. And they were playing symphonic music from Europe, but you know, there were no, there was no American symphonic music. And what was the source, what was going to be the source of the original distinctly American music? But so Thurber <clears throat> wrote to, to Dvorak and wanted him to come and teach at the conservatory because he was important at that point because he had been promoted by Brahms, uh, his close friend. The, Dvorak was really at the peak of his career in 1890, he died, I think, in 1970. Anyway, so she sent him a contract, and it was for more money than he had ever earned, you know, that he was going to earn in two years at, at the conservatory. But he didn't want to leave. I, I think they were living in Prague. He didn't want to leave Prague and, and Europe. He was happy to stay there. But they had five children, and his wife saw this contract track. So she, <laughs> she forged his signature and said, <laughs> She did. She did. She's one of my heroes. <laughs> you never had the woman world surface. Well, you know, exactly. Right. Absolutely. Right. Oh. I mean, she. What she saw in it was this would solve all of their financial problems. <laughs> and sure, we can move all five kids to America. I'll organize it off we go. <laughs> and so they did. Well, <clears throat> at the conservatory, um, Dvorak's assistant was a young African American, Harry T. Burley. Um, and um, Burley. Burley was, grew up in a free black family. He was born in 1866 in Erie, Pennsylvania. But his grandfather, his maternal grandfather had been a slave. And from, this is clearly a musical family. Burley heard his grandfather singing these spirituals, which, you know, he had heard them growing up and he sang them for Dvorak. And Dvorak said, you have to write these down. We can thank him for the fact that they were written down. Mm -hmm. I have not forgotten because Burley is the person who wrote them down. Now, when you look at spirituals in your our hymnal, none of them are attributed to Harry Burley. The only thing in our hymnal that's attributed to him is the two note, in Christ there is no east or west, which he composed. The reason that the spirituals aren't is that they're in the public domain. He wrote them down, he arranged, he wrote arrangements of them, but they didn't belong to him. He had composed them. But it's important that he gets his due for this, that the fact that he sang them for Dvorak, and then it was this European who said, you have to write these down. But not only did he say that, he said, this is the original American music. True. White people did not want to hear that at that point. They did not want to hear that. The, you know, the uh, distinctly American music, what Dvorak said was it was these spirituals or music arising from the Native Americans. And the reason was Dvorak was very interested in folk songs. I mean, his, even his symphonies have echoes of, of Bohemian folk songs in them. And um, the New World Symphony has this, well, it was a new, something that sounds like a folk song in, in the, one of the quiet, quiet movements. By the way, did any of you come to the Embler Symphony Friday evening? Because they played the New World Symphony wow. during Friday evening. No. Yeah. Um, just an interesting coincidence, you know, they played it on Friday and I'm talking about it today. <laughs> Um, Seriously so, cool. <laughs> yeah, so 
he was very interested in folk music in a way that lots of other Europeans would not have been. He has a piano trio that's called the Dumki, and it's all based on folk songs, uh, this piano trio, because like I said, he had a particular love for them. But what's so intriguing to me is that the, the spirituals, you know, are the basis for jazz, and which is then the basis for rock and pop music. It's that sense of rhythm and so on that arose out, out of the spirituals, you know, kind of a rhythm, I guess, that is African in origin. Um, but that, all of that came together at forming the music that, that most people listen to uh, today. So, but we're going back to the, uh, to the spirituals themselves. So let's, um, let's look at 325. Sure, I don't. We'll have to mm -hmm. um, You know, it's just repeating the same words pretty much in my trials when I'm in trouble, when my heart is almost breaking when my head is bowed in sorrow. Uh, I mean, those are, that's the extent of the, of the change in the words, but I want Jesus to walk with me. A sense of not being alone. Exactly. Uh, similar to what you, we read in, in the song, that, you know, Lord, how long, uh, but I praise you. Uh, One of the things that happens in our culture, and this is what I, when I'm talking about the enlightenment, is this sense of God becoming farther and farther away. Um, that um, before we put so much faith in medicine, it used to be that our trust had to be in God because medicine couldn't do much for us, and. One of the problems we have today is that we think that medicine can do everything when in fact it can't. Um, my wife's a hospice nurse, and so I'm well aware of the fact that most of the time we um, we rely on medicine a lot longer than we should. Um, it's, but um, and you know some of it is, of course. It, denial of our mortality. Uh, but yeah, I, I can talk about that one. But this sense that in the spirituals and in the Psalms and in the Bible generally, there's this, a sense of union with God in Christ that and for Christians, this is especially true. The God that we worship is the one who became human in Jesus Christ and, sh and shared all of what it means to be human, including suffering and death. And so those things don't separate us from God and God's love. As Paul puts it in Romans 8, nothing in this world or out of it can separate us from God and God's love in Jesus Christ. But people who have not been formed as in a community, the way the people who sing the spirituals or uh, the hymns that are based on the Psalms or the Psalms, just don't understand that. There, there are a lot of people who believe they're alone in the world. Um, and the spirituals are, are kind of a, an antidote to that. One of the things about I want Jesus to walk with me is it reminds me a bit of the ending of the hymn, The Church is One Foundation. The last stanza ends with the words that we like saints before us may see you face to face. But there's this 
you know, Paul says, now we see through a glass dimly, but then face to face. Now we see in part, then we will be fully known. Not that we will know fully, but that we will be fully known, uh, joined, joined to God. Um, well, let's go to 614. Um, there's a bond in Gilead. Church, could I just very quickly share something that's, that supports so much what you're saying? When my husband died, the house cleaner, a, a friend of mine, I came to see me. She happened to be black and she sang to me. She sang to me. And I felt so loved and so comforted and so not alone because she knew in those words exactly what was breaking my heart. And so what you were telling us, I am a walking, talking testament to the veracity of that. So I'll just say this. Don't have funerals in the funeral home because you can't sing. You don't have yeah. hymnals. Yeah. You don't have hymnals. You don't have anything to support the singing. You know, funeral homes are for people who aren't part of the community of faith. Because it's so it's so frustrating to you know to try that you can't I think I think she wants to say Sally, Sally wants to say, wants to say something. Yeah. Can you hear me? Put your mic on Sally. You're muted. You're muted. Yeah. Okay. You're no. still muted. You have to unmute yourself. You have to unmute. There you go. There you go. Yeah, you can say Aston. Now, can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Uh, still can't hear you. Yeah. Still. Still can't hear me. Those of us online can hear her. Can you hear me? Up, but I don't know how. I can hear you, Sally. This was plugged in. The limitations of yeah. Yeah. technology. Yeah. Here. It's it's something with the other speaker, so I don't know. Yeah. Don't you worry. Sorry. Sorry. Sorry, Sorry, Sally. Sorry, Sally. We'll have Sorry. to hold it. Okay. In the chat. <laughs> That's true. You could type it. Can in you the chat. type it in the chat? Do you know how to can do that? You, okay. This is Linda Breckenridge. Can you hear me? Okay, I can hear you. Oh, anyway. Yeah. yeah no, they can't they, sell. They, it. They, it's, okay. It's, they assume you want to be quiet. They play music. Oh. And they shut it off. And oh. It's all about talking, you know. And it's just they're not. So, they they assume that. Uh, people who want to sing are going to have it in the church, which makes sense because it's so much easier. We have everything that we need to do it, yeah. and they yeah. don't. Um, well, okay. uh, I'm not seeing the chat, so thank you. You have a couple minutes. Sure. <laughs> I mean, they even done one where we sang at the graveside. My father's funeral. Because uh, among the Mennonites, you know, they, they have a lot of these hymns memorized. So, you know, we'd be at the graveside and they'd say, well, let's sing. And we, you know, we'd sing. Well, I, sometimes they were hymns I knew and sometimes they weren't. Um, but at my father's funeral, I decided we should sing, you know, at the committal. And so I printed out a hymn on this paper. My best friend, who's a church musician, was handing out the piece of paper saying to people, Here's another hymn you will never be able to sing again. <laughs> <laughs> Which brings me to something. People will say to me, Well, I, after someone dies, I can't come to church because I cry when we're singing hymns. To which I say, That's what they're for. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there are lots of hymns I can't sing without starting to. Yeah, because I associate them with yes, someone right. or I, who's died, or I associate them with some experience. I mean, it just it gets worse as you get older. Yeah. 
You got to look more to love them, man. Well, I guess that's what it is. Uh, I have other theories about it, but it, you know, it, it's just a thing. Yeah. So there is a balm in Gilead, which this is a very popular one. Um, sometimes I feel discouraged and think my work's in vain, but then the Holy Spirit revives my soul again. If you cannot preach like Peter, if you cannot pray like Paul, if you can tell the love of Jesus and say he died for all. Don't ever be discouraged, for Jesus is your friend. <clears throat> and if you lack for knowledge, he'll ne'er refuse to lend. But the refrain, there is a balm in Gilead. Well, what's Gilead? That, you know, it's an image. It's an image of the kingdom of God someplace where we aren't, where we'd like to be. Um, and that it's for that that we're longing. Um, the novelist Mar Marilyn Robinson has a series of books. The first one is titled Gilead. Mm -hmm. And they're about a, a, a Presbyterian minister and his family. Um, uh, apparently Barack Obama had an extensive correspondence with her about these books. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, I'm taking one of them to Mexico with me, the second one, just when I started reading. Um, it's funny, you know, when you retire, you have more time to read. Yeah, which is beautiful. I'm reading all sorts of books that I bought years ago and never got to read. <laughs> okay, well, let's look at, if you don't have any questions about that, let's go to 770, Give Me Jesus. Oh, our band plays that. In the morning, dark midnight, break of day, when I come to die, when I want to sing, um, and give me Jesus is the refrain. Um, again, it's looking to Jesus is almost a place of refuge, um, certainly a source of refuge uh, in, in a dark, dark time. That one we're going to sing, I think, next Sunday at, at 1030. Um, and then, what wondrous love, which is not a spiritual, an African-American spiritual. It's, it's a folk hymn <clears throat> from the 19th century. Um, and it's from the South. But it isn't uh, an African American. Six six six, the number of the beast. Yeah. According to the <laughs> yeah, I can say it. Oh, my. <laughs> I, we once we once had that, that as our phone exchange. We had a an auto repair man who wouldn't call it. <laughs> so this one uh, is especially appropriate for the fourth Sunday in Latin. What wondrous love is this? Um, to bear the dreadful curse for my soul. Uh, when, but then the second verse, when I was sinking down, sinking down beneath God's righteous crown, Christ laid aside his crown for my soul. And then to God and to the lamb, I will sing. And when I'm from death, I'm free. I'll sing on. I'll sing on. This is very similar to the spirituals in its repetitiveness and even the kind of the style of the tune um, because it's, it's modal. It's not, you know, major or minor, 
And the way you can tell that, notice it has no key signature, which means it's ostensibly in the key of C. But you can always tell what key something's actually in by looking at the base note of the last note in the base. And it's a D, which means this is actually in the Dorian mode. Which means what? Well, <laughs> modes were pre minor and major. Lots of rock music is modal. Lots of it is. Do they know that? Yeah, some of them do. <laughs> <laughs> some of them do. Um, I mean, I don't know a lot about music theory, but I've learned about modes and stuff because sometimes Bach used them. And in a, there are few things that I, of his that I play that are modal. Um, and the Dorian mode was probably the most popular one. Um, well, out of the depths, which we looked at, that's in the Phrygian mode. That, that's it. Ends in an E. Uh, enough about that. But, oh, it's uh, fascinating. Um, and then 333, Jesus is a rock. Okay. I'm looking at the my watch. Okay. Yeah. What time is it? 10 minutes, 10 is it 10 minutes? Yes. Oh, <laughs> a rock. This is a rock in a weary land, a weary land. No one can do like Jesus, not a mumbling word, he said. He went walking down to Lazarus' grave and raised him from the dead. You know, when the, where the spirit plays that, yeah. it sounds like a spiritual. It is I, a spiritual. I know, but what yeah. I'm saying, it sounds it like it's with her. Oh, good. A rock. Okay, well, I'm supposed to go back. Yeah. Down there. <laughs> <laughs> and I did I'll get the book again, but are we not less? Yes. yes. I feel like I just attended. Hello. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye.